Let us pray. Creator God, your word is the rock beneath our feet, a firm foundation for our lives. Send to us your Holy Spirit to be our guide and our light of understanding as we listen for your wisdom this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, your living word. Amen. One year ago in March, I remember standing here on the first Sunday that we offered a live stream worship service, that we gathered to give thanks to God. We offered prayers for the uncertainty of what we was ahead of us. We lifted our voices, trusting that you, wherever you were, were lifting your voices too. Even though in-person worship was canceled, I remember saying these words, love wasn't canceled. Mercy wasn't canceled. Prayer wasn't canceled. Hope wasn't canceled. And especially the command to love our neighbors as Christ loves us wasn't canceled either. Through the year, we have been together apart and finding new ways to connect and be the church in new ways. In our series, This Lent, A Journey Back to Love, we find ourselves ever so close to Holy Week. The year has proven to be a very lengthy journey. I often wonder sometimes if we even really left the Lent of 2020. The lengthy journey of discovery exploration, fatigue, heartache, lament, sorrow, unimaginable loss. Well, there's also been challenge and growth, awareness and surprise, support and understanding. Let's say Lent is our season of honesty. It is a reality check on our lives. It is a time when we have an opportunity to break out of the illusions that we face and face the reality of our life in preparation for Easter. When we welcome a radical new beginning. What's the stark reality that you face? What hardship has knocked on your door this last year? What challenge is present now that you never saw coming? Well, our text from the prophet Jeremiah shed some light on this. this. This text is situated in a season of failure in ancient Israel. The city of Jerusalem has been conquered and burned by the Babylonian army. The temple has been destroyed. The monarchy has been terminated. The leading citizens deported to exile. Over a long period of time, Israel refused the commandments that God had given them in Sinai. Israel did not take justice seriously and did not ground its life in the God of the Exodus, thus turning away from God. And so, in a covenantal promise and perspective, came the judgment of God. Well, Jeremiah tells the people that this is not the end of the story. Even now, God is making the first move to restore their relationship. God promises to make a new and even better covenant with them, to forge an even more honest, open, and intimate connection with God's people. The people have sinned, yes, but God's forgiveness flows from an even deeper generosity from the depth of God's longing to know and be known by God's people. In the new covenant with God that was read just a few minutes ago, the poet writes, but this is the covenant that I make with the, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another, nor say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from 
the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. This covenant restores the relationship between God and Israel. It offers new hope, new possibility, a new life that all will know God. To know God in a new way means that there's a readiness to treasure this relationship with God. God's assertion on this new covenant is one that overrides any of the painful truth of that previous broken covenant. The new covenant is an act of God's inexplicable mercy and graciousness. What we learn from the covenant that God makes with Israel is that it's God's initiative. It is God who makes the first move. The renewal of a covenant is entirely God's action. There's no initiative from humanity in this case. Sins are forgiven and forgotten as a way to make all things new. God is saying, I love you as my people and I will be with you forever. How deep must this love be for God to come so far to be with the ones God loves? For those of us who wonder what it means to maintain a relationship with God when our normal routine is far from normal, you might be asking yourself, how do I maintain a spiritual practice? My routine, my worshipful spirit, when I cannot do as I usually have done. What does it look like right now to keep my covenant, the covenant that God makes with me? Well, if you have concerns about your own covenantal keeping, know this, that God is very persistent. God is relentlessly persistent to figure out how to be in relationship with us. And that is very promising. And it offers a hopeful word that will carry us through. Because time and time again, we falter and we fail. And we fall short of what it means to support one another and to support a neighbor in need. When we become complacent with our practices or complicit in our silence, God always seeks us out to renew the new covenant of love. As Lent is our season of honesty, let's for a moment address the concerns that threaten the command to love neighbor as Christ loves us especially this week, especially in light of the threat of our own Asian and Asian American Pacific Islander siblings and the threats they face each and every day. Since this time last year, 3,795 incidents were reported from all 50 states and the District of Columbia to the group called Stop Asian and Pacific Islander Hate. A Pew Research study reported three in 10 Asian Americans have experienced racial slurs and racist jokes since the beginning of the pandemic. Hateful rhetoric and physical violence, mean tweets that stoke internet threats have continued to fracture relationships by targeting people's lives in our own families, in our own churches, in our own communities. Five days ago, March 16th, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, Robert Aaron Long killed eight people. Eight of our neighbors lost to a senseless act of gun violence once again. Six of those souls were Asian American women. We'll remember them and we'll lift their names now. 
Soon Chung Park, Hyun Jung Grant, Sun Cha Kim, Yang A. Yui, Zhao J. Tan, Dao Yu Fen, Delania Ashley Yaun, Paul Andre Michaels. All beloved children of God, beautiful in God's sight. Souls taken from families and friends too soon, from their life's work too soon. And while it's reported that the motive is unclear, it's hard to disentangle race from these killings. And if we are being honest, We've seen this kind of hate before. We saw it in 2018 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at the Tree of Life Synagogue, killing 11 people. We saw it again in 2016 in Orlando, Florida at the Pulse nightclub, killing 49 people. We saw it again in 2015 in Charleston, South Carolina at Mother Emanuel African American Episcopal Church killing nine people at a Bible study. In his letter from the Birmingham jail, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. recalls the times when he would drive by the large, white, prominent churches in the South and asked himself, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Well, what kind of people worship here? I hope over time you'll help me dig in to help answer that question more fully. Well, the kind of people who worship here are the kind of people who speak up and speak out against the xenophobic rhetoric and white supremacy and misogyny and hate that fractures our communities and our country. The kind of people who worship here are the kind who are willing to march for justice and work with local leaders to make real change for our neighbors here in this city. The type of people who worship here continue to work for the ways that we know we can do better and how we can see each other more clearly and how we can honor each other more deeply. The kind of people who lead with our humanity and all of our hurts and our brokenness and our brokenheartedness. Well, the kind of people who worship here are those who stand with and stand for and stand beside anyone who is judged, hated, and even killed because the color of their skin, their sexuality and gender identity, their beliefs or background. At the very least, that's the kind of people we hope to be. The kind of people we feel called to be. But more pressing is the question that links us back to the prophet Jeremiah and the new covenant with God. Is the question, who is our God? Ours is a God who loves us, each and every one of us, just as we are. Full stop. Ours is a God who does not stand for racism or bigotry or sexism or misogyny or hatred of any of its varied forms. Our God is a good and gracious and a just God. But to our Asian siblings who are now terrified, to those of you who the world has just given another reason to be more scared or more alienated. You, beloved, are not alone. This church will stand with you. We will stand beside you, we see you, and we love you. But most of all, God sees you, and God loves you. The covenant that God places on our hearts 
is to be a God who loves beyond human understanding and yet became human, that we might come to know just how deep and how wide and how all-consuming that love really is. So as we walk close to Holy Week, may we seek all the ways that we can be in relationship with God and with one another for the sake of the world. Amen.